Well, it's part of the name of the game, Dungeons and Dragons. So how about a brand new module that's going to take you a three tier one through three adventure all about dragons. This is Dragon Relics out on the DMs Guild. Hopefully, by the time you're watching this video, it'll take you through levels one to about 15 in a journey all throughout the Anorak Desert. If you want to see more about that adventure, stay tuned. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> so let's jump over to the dms guild a big thank you again to my friend lb hack em up for helping me do that intro bit more on her when we get to the end uh that being said first off 35 dollars, 34.95 to pick up a copy of this so it's not cheap i won't be i won't lie there but it is for all intents and purposes a full-blown D, D campaign you will go from level one to level 12 if you play this from start to finish that is about as much as a level up as you'll get in any of the modern D&D books like Strahd or things like that. Actually, uh, like Descent into Avernus, I think, was levels 1 to 13. Um, downside, it is only available in PDF. You can't get it print on demand. There's I, I a whole bunch of logistical things that I don't fully understand on the DM's Guild side of what gets picked for print on demand and what doesn't. That being said, I don't know what the price would be for print on demand, but... What I can assure you is you will be getting a very good product that is just a really just a good D&D &D adventure. Like this is a campaign that I could easily see myself running and one if someone ran it for me, I feel like I'd have a good sense of accomplishment. It hits a lot of, I don't want to call them tropes because I feel like there's a negative connotation when people use the term tropes but it hits a lot of the key things that i want in what i envision in a DD &D adventure uh, and it does those very well it has a lot of uh, breadth of combat and role play and things like that um and we're gonna go through a chunk of it and i'll talk about little bits as we go through so the main author the author on this is jvc parry uh this should really probably be no stranger to you uh, if you're familiar with DM's Guild, I've done, if we scroll down, you can see a handful of different works that JVC Parry has done themselves, as well as working together with other people on a bunch of stuff. I mean, just look at all, look at this, this resume, right? Uh, and you know what? There is a ton of stuff. A lot of these are also offered on Fantasy Grounds as well. Um, and I've done a handful of reviews of these. I've done, I think, a Grim Encounters on the channel I've reviewed. I've done, um, I don't know, I've done, I think, Unearthed Tips and Tricks, I did the All Around Guide, I did the Theocracy, and so on. So I've done a bunch, and that's a testament to how good things are handled. You can see there's a plenty of art here, there's maps, obviously there's preview pages you could download and look through it, and it, it basically is seven chapters, uh, and I wanted to talk a little bit about it, so again, I'm not going to go through the whole thing because we're gonna be there forever. Uh, I will say again, as I've had to state, because people don't get it, it has chapters and bookmarks, folks. You think that that seems like a dumb thing, but the fact, like the high profile PDFs that are released that don't have this, that I need to hunt and peck for pages, or some of them don't even have a table of contents at the start, and it's just like, how am I supposed to find things? Like, anyway, so, uh, Potential spoiler warning, right? I'm going to try to hit on the very high level stuff. There's a section that I do want to read to you specifically. There is new player options. There is new magic items. There is new monsters as well. So I'm going to try to give you a little sampling of some of the new monsters, a sampling of at least one of the magic items, and we'll talk about the player uh, choices and, and my thoughts on those. I'm going to do a quick kind of scan through an overview of all of the different chapters and kind of what's going on there. And then uh, there's a section in the third chapter that I really like, which is a little bit different uh, than what I have seen in other games. And it's just a fun like encounter that I want to kind of read through. So spoilers, potentially, you have been warned. So uh, basically, it is a seven chapter uh, story. And you can see here all the different chapters tumbling down, frozen in time, blood at the auction, Beneath the Sands, Dragon Incarnate, The Theocracy, and Destroying the Devourer. And then we have a couple of appendices. We have, uh, you know, character descriptions here. 
pronouns for them, where they appear. We have a map of the Anorak Desert. I should say it is take it does take place in the Forgotten Realms. It is heavily Anorak Desert specific. So that is, uh, you know, if you're if you're familiar with the Anorak Desert and you want a little bit more information on it, this is good for that. Um, and basically what I want to do is just kind of give you a heads up as to what the, I'll, I'll kind of quickly read through the different chapter descriptions on a high level and why I think it's such a good adventure, right? So you start off at a tavern, right? That's a, that's a standard thing. Uh, and then basically a bunch of stuff goes down, cloud giant castle crashes, stuff's going on, big evil bad dragon boss of the campaign is back, right? There's a whole bunch of lore behind that dragon. I don't feel like diving too much into it, but trying to make a whole new dragon empire. So you team up with some other, you know, potential new allies and are decide we're going to go and, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to stop this, right? So that's kind of how your adventure starts. We need to take down an ancient blue dragon. What's the best way to do that? Well, let's get some resources to do that. So uh, first up is... You're going to track down an arrow of blue dragon slaying. Well, that makes sense. We're trying to kill a blue dragon. So we got to go and we got to get that. Next up, we're going to try to get some bronze dragon scale mail. Okay, well, that's going to give us lightning resistance. So that's a good call. Then we're going to try to get a dragon slayer greatsword. We're trying to basically build up our repertoire of dragon felling, um, you know, implements so we can take down this dragon. Then... Uh, we're going to try to get the Dragonfall Horn, a sort of artifact to help us do that. Um, and then eventually, you know, the showdown. I will also say that several of these chapters are a lot of their work is sampled from other JVC parry creations. Like uh, chapter three is called Blood at the Auction. A lot of that is taken from an adventure written previously called Blood at the Auction. Uh, same thing with chapter four, Beneath the Sands takes from that. Um, chapter six is called the theocracy. It takes a lot from the theocracy adventure. And I wanted to point out that just because that stuck out in my mind, um, I actually reviewed the theocracy way back in June of 2018 channel was significantly smaller way back in the day. And you can actually see me look at this shorter hair. The beard's not white. I'm in my old house with the old D and D table. And I'm here reviewing the theocracy, right? I really, really like this adventure a lot. Um, so yeah, uh, you can go back and search through the channel. There's a lot of DM skilled stuff on the channel if you go back and look. So that being said, we're gonna kind of flip through some of this. Uh, it's gonna have a lot of good stuff to touch on throughout. You're gonna have, again, you've got kind of like a ship based thing because you got a, there's a boat action here. Uh, and then the one that I really like is chapter three, Blood at the Auction. It has an auction. So that's the, the, the kind of encounter that I want to read to you going through the actual auction itself. And then this one also kind of has like a whodunit vibe. So you've got like, you've got overland travel, you've got role play, you've got murder mystery, you've got dungeon crawl, you've got a lot of good stuff. Again, like I, I call them tropes because they kind of are, but like, I guess the key points you also have um kind of at the start of the chapter all the characters a little brief description about them there's art for pretty much every character in the game i also really like simple thing these little swords appear basically whenever there's like kind of information you could gather from a check instead of like bullet points they're swords which is a simple factor that i really like you can see we've got a couple of different npcs here um and i want to just get to the auction so it has rules for running an auction, something that I've never actually done uh, or I tried to do. And it was really weird because like I'm trying to bid against my players in an auction. So I didn't really like it. These rules are better. Um, OK, so below are the rules for auctions of mundane items. Each auction takes place in rounds where an item is presented uh, has a starting price set and then bids are made to start this process. Roll on the tables to determine which item is up for sale. Then use the cost modifiers next to each result to determine a starting price, minimum of 25 gold pieces. There can be as many items as you want. Once you've determined which item is up for sale and a starting price, the auction begins. Characters can place a bid on the item that is the starting price of at least 25 gold pieces, uh, or, or, or sorry, at the starting price or at least 25 gold pieces higher than the previous price at any time. Then roll a d6 
the result being how many more bids are placed on the item before the characters can get another bid in. So it's kind of almost like taking rounds, essentially. Or if they choose not to bid again, the final price of the item. Characters can also use their skills to help with the auction. A character might decide to dissuade somebody with a perception or, or, or persuasion or performance check. Uh, success, uh, DC 15 is the, is the number. A success results in two fewer bids, minimum one. A failure results in two more bids. Characters can also try to get an idea of how much an item is worth with the successful DC 15 intelligence check. If they succeed, roll on the following table. Uh, if the result of a check is five or low, roll on the table and feed them a false uh, result, rolling the real value in secret. Uh, and then you can see the true value table right here. So you can see here, here's the items, right? You've got a D10, a bracelet, comb, dagger, ring, whatever. And then it has a section here on the origin of it, which could add more to it. The material that it's made out of, right? Maybe it's uh, our material, special materials. It's made out of wood. It's made out of quartz. Uh, these are multipliers it's made out of bloodstone. You multiply it by three. Electra, multiply it by eight. And then it might have a feature. It's antique. It's cracked. It's going to take money off. It's engraved. It's got filler, filigree, gilded, tarnished. And then enchanted, they, some of these have minor enchantments here. Beacon, it lights up. Compass, it lets you... These are kind of the minor uh, abilities that are in the Dungeon Master's Guide that you can add to magic items, right? Uh, you suffer no harm in cold temperatures. It floats and so on. You learn a language. It never gets dirty. Again, fun things. So you can do this after uh, the auction of mundane items concludes. All regular guests prepare to leave and blah, blah, blah. That's that. Then there's a more high profile auction where there's kind of like an exhibit and there's some high profile stuff and they have significantly higher prices because they're all magical. And I like these because each one of them has a story and some of them have quirks or other properties. So there's this glamored studded leather that you can see here and it has a story behind it. It's a gnomish construction uh, in, uh, given to the dwarves in charge of this by Twitchy Fingers, a rock gnome thief who stole a shipment of gemstones from the family mine. Uh, and then it basically, it just has the specifics of glamour studded leather, starting price 3000 gold. And you go through that. Goggles of night, same thing. You know, it's got story behind it. Here's a necklace of prayer beads. It's gonna tell you what they do. This one has the war leader quirk. So you can use an action to have their voice, your voice carry out to 300 feet. The Ring of Protection doesn't have anything in the Wand of Magic Missiles here as a quirk. While underground, you always know uh, the item's depth below the surface and the direction to the nearest staircase uh, ramp or other path leading upwards. And it says, obviously, you can change these out if you want. But I like this. I li again, this whole concept of running an auction is a fun little aspect of D&D &D that I've never really dealt with. And I really like that. And then, obviously, the, the chapter will progress. And again, had I known about this, I probably would have just picked up blood at the auction a long time ago because that is essentially what most of this chapter is uh and we've got beneath the sands this one here uh has a lot of stuff from like tomb of annihilation uh not the adventure tomb of annihilation but it gives me that vibe because it's kind of a jungle um we have a, see here's the jungle here this looks like an incarnate map which is pretty cool um so traversing the jungle, we have jungle encounters. We have a whole bunch of dinosaurs. So if you have a druid in the party or people that have never seen dinosaurs, this is a means for the characters to encounter dinosaurs, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then we have um, sort of the random encounter kind of tables like you have in Tomb of Annihilation. And like you might find some random treasure or different creatures. So I enjoy that a lot. Uh, we have, again, a bunch of different locations. Um, so I think this is, is almost like a Gygax uh, anagram. But anyway, you've got all that going on. Then we jump to chapter five, and this is more drag. And then we have the theocracy section, which is basically that adventure. I say that's chapter six. Um, anyway, uh, then we have kind of the final showdown. And then here's the new monster section. Now, the new monster section does have a bunch of creatures. Uh, in here that are from other books and adventures. There are some that are unique to this book and, or this module. And some of them are not technically unique in that they have been in other adventures written by JVC Perry, like the Theocracy and so on. Um, but I'm going to just highlight a couple. Um, you'll see a lot of these are pulled from either like some of these are Tomb of Annihilation. Some of these are um, Horde of the Dragon Queen, right? All the, the dragon masks and the dragon fangs and 
So the Holy Hound, absolutely love this. is one of my favorite creatures in all existence. It's a winged dog. And who doesn't love a dog with wings? Uh, it's also a celestial lawful good creature. Uh, we can see the stat block right here. Uh, immune to radiant damage. Typical dog stuff. Keen hearing and smell. Pack tactics. Uh, it has a bite attack that does piercing damage and radiant damage. And then most importantly, it has a radiant breath weapon, which is just wild to think about that on a dog. 15 foot cone, DC 12 dex save, or 66 radiant damage. Plus, I mean, it's super cute. Who doesn't love that, right? I mean, we have the ice spiders, ice toads were in uh, Horde of the Dragon Queen and Rise of Tiamat. Got some named NPCs, Commodons, Lamias. I don't know if Lizard Folk Rough Riders, those may be uh, specific to this adventure. Uh, Orp Sue is pretty interesting. Flying nocturnal predators that feed on fresh blood, hairless rat tailed creatures that flap. Uh, with flap-like wings between their single-clawed insectoid feet. They range from mottled crimson to a cinnamon brown and have veined, leathery skin. Orpsu can emit a hideous screeching sound, which causes temporary paralysis. While paralyzed in such a way, the Orpsu feeds upon the creature by raking their skin to draw blood and using proboscis-like tentacles that emerge from their stomach to drink the life-giving fluid. That's terrifying, and this is like a, a just a weird... Like a funkier sturge. I don't like it. Uh, it's, I think it might be for this adventure or one of the other ones take a look at it tiny 15 armor class only seven hit points um has claws that do a d4 plus three while wounded you lose hit points at the start of each of your turn as it's drinking your blood um let's see it lands on one wounded creature uses its tentacles to drink that creature's blood they lose hit points uh it regains hit points whatever happens and then it's screech is um targets one creature within 30 feet if it can hear it it makes a con save or become paralyzed for one minute that could be pretty nasty. Then we have some more of the high level characters here. I will point out that the you know the main kind of dragon does have spell casting, which makes it significantly more powerful and good in my mind. A couple other creatures here I remember from seeing, I think, the Theocracy. Then we have some new magic items. Uh, the one I want to talk about here is probably, I think, the coolest one is the Dragon Fall Horn. Um, it's rare, requires a two mint, and when you blow into it as an action, it lets you cast the Earthbind spell with a DC 20. For those of you who don't know, Earthbind is basically, it reduces movement speed and helps try to tr keep flying creatures on the ground. So it's a DC 20, uh, once per day, basically. But dragons have disadvantage on the saving throw against this, meaning that its purpose is to bring down dragons. And I really like that this is like, a, you're, you're seeking out an anti-dragon uh, weapon, uh, armory here. We have three feats here. The first two, I can kind of care less about, right? Uh, Arctic Acclimation and Desert Acclimation, you become resistant to cold damage and are immune to the effects of extreme cold or extreme heat. Uh, as we learned with the Goliath in, um, in Icewind Dale, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, how that's gone, uh, by having resistance to cold damage or resistance to fire damage, you therefore are also immune to the effects of extreme cold or extreme heat. So that's why they changed the way the Goliaths, uh, they just gave them resistance to cold damage instead uh, in that new update because one is redundant. So essentially you are just taking a feat to get resistance in one damage type. And again, I, you might say, well, that's pretty good. But I would say again, look to the tiefling and infernal constitution gives you a plus one to your constitution resistance to uh, cold and poison damage and advantage on saving throws against poison and tieflings are inherently resistant to fire. So that's one feat, gives you a bonus to one ability score and resistance to two damages. Uh, so these I could probably live without. And then we have Scimitar Mastery as a, um, a feat here. Let's take a look at this one. You get a plus one bonus to attack rolls you make with a Scimitar. Okay, whenever you have advantage on a melee attack you make with this weapon and hit, you can disarm the target if the lower of the 2d20 rolls would also hit the target. And when you take the attack action to attack with the weapon, you can use a bonus action to make a second attack with the weapon. You don't add your ability modifier to the damage of the bonus attack unless the modifier is a negative. So this kind of reminds me of the original kind of Honored Arcana weapon, feats for weapons that we didn't end up getting. It's okay. It's better. Uh, I think, again, you still have some better options out there, especially the new ones that we got, like the Slash, the Crusher, and all those other ones we got in the most recent Unarthurkana. Then we have two sub-races. These are just other types of humans, and then it just gives you a suggestion for the feat to get for Variant Human. And we do have a new uh, 
halfling subrace called the Weaver Halfling. Um, and they get a plus one to charisma, proficiency in performance, and can read and write uh, one extra language of their choice. I still think that's kind of weak on the halfling scale, considering some of them get like resistance to poison damage or telepathy. Uh, so it's those I think leave a little bit to be desired. But, uh, you know, obviously you're getting this for the adventure, not the couple of little uh, things at the end here. Uh, that being said, um, I really I, I'm not positive on this, but it says for the saviors of Tharn. And I don't know, but like in my mind, I, I wish I had a little context behind this because I kind of hope that this is the four, like the party of four that JVC Perry wrote and ran this adventure for. And if that's the case, I think that that's absolutely awesome. Like this was the people who played through your game and you got art commissioned in the art style of the book of the four people who kind of play tested this adventure. And you put, looks like their character name as well as the player name, right? Uh, you know, Tully Sprocket Cog is probably the gnome's name. And then there's a person, the Julia King and so on. And I think that's really awesome. And I, I, I don't know if I ever get in a chance to write an adventure myself and publish it somewhere. Oops. I think I would love to do that because that, that just seems like a cool way to honor your players. Um, so that's it for me. Let me know your thoughts on Dragon Relics in the comments down below. Uh, it's only been out for about three days at this point. I hope to have this video out on the day it released, but that being said, uh, Hurricane uh, response was just dominating all of my time. Um, so uh, let me know again what your thoughts are. Uh, do you want to pick this up? What you know? What are your reservations? My guess is most people are going to tell me it's the thirty-five dollar price tag. Um, and you know there might be something to that. It is a full-blown level one to twelve campaign. Um, you know I don't really have any concept of how long it would take to run this. That's really dependent on the group. You know, uh, you know, some people can run Horde of the Dragon Queen and Rise of Tiamat in a couple months, a couple weeks, really, depending if you play it back to back. Others can take a super long time. Um, so again, a big thank you to my good friend LB Hackamup, who you saw at the beginning, representing that dragon head that popped up over my shoulder. Uh, I will have links to all of LB's stuff down in the description. Uh, her and I play on my Twitch channel uh, every Wednesday night. She plays Siren. I play Lagwin. We... Uh, play with our good friend Jordan with the silent pH in the middle runs the game so you can check her out there as well as her her Twitter and her her own Twitch channel she streams multiple times a week um, and then her YouTube channel where she uploads uh, the actual play kind of stuff um, also I have a giveaway going on to win uh, one of these super shiny uh, limited edition copies of Mythic Odysseys of Theros uh, check the link in the description to enter to win that as well Anyone can enter, and it's open to international folks as well. Uh, and once uh, finally, thank you to my patrons over on Patreon for continuing to support me and the channel. I will see you all next time.